welcome to the awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listings photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. You're listening to the Awesomers Podcast. This is the Awesomers Podcast, episode number 34, and our tradition has been established that if you want to find the show notes or any relevant details that we may throw in there, some bonus links, etc., just go to awesomers.com slash 34. That's awesomers.com backslash 34 for any relevant show details. Now, today, our guest, uh, David Somerfleck, is going to give us a little bit of a taste about web design and kind of refresh our memory how important web design could be. David is a trained and certified court mediator, the author of five books, a former college journalism professor, an education program director, founder of three different startups, and an expert in digital marketing, SEO, website development, social media, content marketing, Google AdWords, Facebook advertising, the list goes on and on. And he has a traditional boots-on-the-ground advertising background as well. David has been a certified business mentor for SCORE, which is a division of the U.S. Small Business Administration and a great little resource for some of those new CEOs that have never heard about it. He's done that for over five years where he's advised hundreds of businesses around the world from large marketing agency owners to lawyers to e-commerce retailers, copywriters, psychologists, mechanics, even startup founders and accountants. We all need help sometimes, don't we? Now, some of David's former clients include the city and county of Denver, Caribou Coffee, AOL Time Warner, and even Microsoft. David's an active member of the Internet Society, the Internet Marketing Association, the Collier County Bar Association, and, and the International Webmasters Association. That's a lot of associations. Fun fact here, and I found this uh, fascinating myself, David once mediated a child custody dispute scheduled to appear on the Judge Judy program and uh, briefly operated a mediation nonprofit organization as well. Uh, this is a guy who understands how to resolve conflicts. Welcome back, Awesomers. It's Steve Simons again, and today I'm joined by David Somerfleck. Did I get that right? Woohoo! Uh, uh, Somerfleck. That's fine. I'm so close. You know, my, my record of getting uh, guest names right is it's really taken a hit this past month. Uh, but, uh, you know, I appreciate you correcting me. So thank you. Uh, and welcome I, aboard. I much worse. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. So we all have. Yeah. Uh, so we've already read David's bio. And, and so everybody kind of knows uh, his deep background and how awesome it is. But I always like to have, you know, somebody to just say in your own words, David, kind of what you do day to day and summarize, you know, where you live and what you do. Uh, so awesomers out there can kind of get to know you. Sure. Basically, what I do is I have a digital marketing business with a very profound emphasis on marketing. The idea is to promote a business so that your phone rings in very, very direct terms. So I have a digital marketing business. Now, I have two divisions of that, which is Sudden Impact Web Design, which obviously focuses on web design and works with a broad spectrum of the public. And second to that, or maybe a part of that, is de facto digital, which works primarily with solo practice lawyers, attorneys, and smaller law firms. Boy, that's an interesting uh, delineation there. So, uh, and right. of course, in the show notes, everybody, you'll be able to find the links to these uh, companies and make sure we get you connected. But uh, and we're going to dive in kind of deeper to both of these. But the one that uh, is just intriguing to me is this general idea that you know, the solo practitioner law uh, firms, I suppose, that, you know, they need a web presence, but when you're a, a solopreneur or a solo uh, lawyer, 
you need to look outside for help. And so uh, how I, is this a new thing? Has this been going on since the internet uh, came down? Or it seems weird to me, I have to say, but uh, what do I know? Nothing. No, I, I don't think it's, it's weird at all. I don't think it, it's that weird, really. Uh, you have to have empathy. And, and that's really, really vital. You've got to be able, no matter what you've been through, you have to be able to reverse your perspective and look at it from the perspective of the client. And I learned this by working with a lot of non-technical uh, small business owners, what you call mom and pop shops, but also working for larger agencies where we would have clients calling who would want to know what can I get done for X amount, it's like you're ordering something at McDonald's. Um, the lawyers basically, you, from their perspective, they go to college, they do their four years. Now you've got an additional number of years that you have to study uh, information that is extremely specific, very, very detailed, uh, very deep. So they graduate from law school. They're experts in civil law, could be family law, could be uh, you know, personal injury, could be divorce or whatever their area of specialty is. Could be, um, I, I spoke to a business litigator. He would just take other businesses to court. Um, I once mediated a child custody dispute. Um, but basically they have this very specialized knowledge and nobody ever really takes them aside and says, this is how you promote your practice. Yeah, My I suppose, boss, yeah, that's a- It really is. They do them a profound disservice. Uh, you know, I mean, my wife is a yoga teacher and she was taking her yoga classes and she graduated. And she said, you know, nobody ever said anything about how do you get clients? How do I get yoga customers? And it seems to be something that is done, you know, um, whatever it is, if you go and you study to be a plumber or you study to be an electrician, uh, they're not going to take you aside and say, this is how you get customers or clients. You know, in the case of lawyers, uh, their area of, of knowledge is very specific, as it is with any other service provider uh, who specializes and makes a decent living. But nobody takes them aside and tells them, this is how you're going to get clients. And there's so many of them that are out there struggling. It's yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. So the phenomena of... Uh, I guess individual single person law firms was the part that was more intriguing to me. The, the phenomena of uh, people don't know what to do in real life, right? Where we yeah. had the entrepreneurial seizure, we started a business and now it's like, where are the customers? That seems, I and mean, that resonates with every entrepreneur on the planet, yeah. uh, lawyer or otherwise, because we all want the same thing, which is more customers, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. The solo practice lawyer, um, I've spoken to many, uh, as you might imagine, and you'll graduate from law school. You have a tremendous amount of student debt. So you've got that stressor on you and now you're trying to find clients. So you're excited. Hey, I'm just, you know, I want to practice what I studied. I believe in this. I can help people. And I really do believe you can make a very, very positive, uh, impact. Um, I've been there. I, I was a mediator. I, I, I know, you know, I have an idea of what they go through. And um, to have that skill and that ability, and you can't find anybody. You know, I read something recently, I think it was uh, the Washington Post. You know, I can't remember exactly the source, but it was something that said 86% of low income Americans cannot get, or if they can't find it and they can't afford civil uh, lawyers to represent them in court, 86%. Meanwhile, how many lawyers are graduating from law school and they can't get work? So there's a profound gap there where the, the people who need the lawyers can't find them and the lawyers who need work, they can't connect with the people who need them. And I think it's a case of you don't know what you don't know. It's not that either party is is there, they're, it's not like they're bad people or anything or that they're purposely making things difficult. They can't do that, but they're just not meeting. They're not connecting. Well, this it's is like if I were to talk to you and I don't have my glasses on, I can't see anything. Yeah, that w without the uh, the knowledge, right? And that's what the internet ultimately fills in is is the knowledge of you know what somebody's service or what's their offering, and does that match up with what my needs are? So I, I really I, I like this premise. I like the fact that you've been in 
in kind of the e-commerce and digital marketing space for so many years. Uh, when we come back from this break, we're going to talk about kind of the, the standard things that everybody's interested in, which is getting more leads. And David's an expert about that. He's going to give us some, some tips and hits, hints. We'll be right back after this. Empower. The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empowery is a network, a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do. Because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. You're listening to the Awesomers Podcast. Okay, here we are. We're back again, and uh, it's Steve Simonson on the Awesomers.com podcast with David Summerfleck. How about that time? Better. Perfect. All right, good. Woo. All right, well, uh, you know, if I could bat 500 in baseball, I'd be a superstar, so uh, I'm, I'm going to take that as a win. So, David, we, we, we teed up before the break that, that, in fact, really every business, almost doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're the solopreneur or the solo law firm or even the big companies. We all kind of want more leads. Yeah. Give us your philosophy of how that problem, uh, you know, kind of manifests itself and then maybe some of your first steps that you take to remedy that problem. You know, where does the problem come from? I, I think the problem really originates. I mean, it, it's based, it depends on where you're coming to it from. If you have a large corporate enterprise and, you know, we've all worked for really, really large businesses really large corporations, these mega corporations. I, I won't go into any names, but I've worked for them independently, freelancing, I've worked for agencies. And um, in a lot of cases, they're so big and so humongous that they're, they're insulated. You know, we have a marketing division for the big company, but what they do is almost done by rote. It's like almost robotic. There's just, there's no thought in innovation or doing anything different. And if you've ever worked in a marketing department for a big major corporation, if you try to innovate or do something new, you know it's very possible that you'll get slapped back down or just told, hey, that's okay, we don't do that here. We don't work like that. They can't pivot. And that's why you see so many large retailers going under now when they're huge, but they just can't compete. They can't innovate. So Amazon comes along and just eats their lunch. Um, now, as far as, which may be your audience more, uh, maybe the solopreneur, the freelancer, the small business owner, maybe the mom and pop shop. Um, with them, they're actually better suited because they're more mobile. They can, they can change uh, approaches very quickly. You know, it's not a big deal for a small or medium business to rebrand and come back with a new online presence or start a new marketing campaign or change something if they're doing a Google AdWords campaign and they want to transition out of that and do a Facebook ad campaign or whatever or start writing new content or change things around or whatever. It's not that big a deal for them. Whereas obviously for a large corporation, it's, it, it's, it's a very big uh, deal. I mean, I was looking at Whole Foods just the other day, which everybody knows was recently acquired by Amazon. So you would think you could go to Whole Foods, look up food, right? Order it, pick it up. Seems reasonable. You know, you can. You can. I went on the website. I'm trying to look at what kind of food they have. It's not there. I can read articles about it, but I can't see if it's on the shelf. I can't order it and then go pick it up. So... Large corporations yeah, have that same disconnect. I got gotcha. you. And so, yeah, they have, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just want to make sure that we, I'm clear on this point. So, if if the big company, let's use the uh, the analogy that you know the big company is the the big um, oil tanker, and the little companies, you know, the the smaller enterprises are the little speedboats, right? The speedboats can change direction, can decide, you know, what we were going for that beach, but it's the choppy water this way, and it's glass over here. Let's take yeah. a right. Whereas that 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 big um, you know, oil tankers not not changing direction, and even if they turn quickly, it'll take a you know miles and miles, and perhaps exactly. uh, you know months and months for that change to take effect. Is that ultimately your point? Exactly, and I think that's a really really good analogy, um, and, and that's really the advantage of being smaller. 
<coughs> excuse me, as compared to these larger businesses, is that you can pivot. You know, um, it's kind of like judo or aikido or something. You know, the larger person comes at you, and you can kind of pivot and redirect. Um, but that's the strength. One of the benefits of being small is you can do things that the larger businesses cannot. Um, as far as you know, getting leads, and getting business, and growing, the smaller enterprise has more adaptability. You can just do more that the larger business can't. Uh, you may not have the financial resources, but quite honestly, if I were to take a hundred small businesses and give them each a million dollars, they wouldn't know what to do with it. They they would what would they invest it in? They don't have PL statements to show you. So they don't, you know, so it's it's kind of it's a tough uh, a, cookie. It's, without a doubt that there's a, a, a question about you know kind of how do you, are you gonna allocate your spend? So on one hand we have the the big complex organizations, and by the way, Procter and Gamble for the Osmers out there listening, you know, a, a long-term, you know, multi-generational company, probably a 100, 150 years old, you know, massive brand, consumer brand, dominant player, owns so many brands that you know the names of. Uh, they are feeling the pressure of the online world, and they are feeling the pressure of these little speedboat brands that are running around. And it's ridiculous. It's crazy, it's, right? Yeah, it's ridiculous because they have so much financial capital, but they just, they don't know how to innovate. They don't know how to be creative. And if you were working in creative with them, you're thinking about the work culture. You don't want to rock the boat. You want to maintain your your, your nice paycheck and you, you want your 401k, you need your health benefits and so on. You can't, they don't really innovate anymore. And that's why you see so many businesses going under now. You know, I mean, if you look at it, really the internet, to me, probably to you, and to many of the, your listeners, the internet is like, okay, so what? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. But for a lot of these business owners, a lot of lawyers, a lot of everybody else, they use it every day, but there's, there's not a connection that this is something that's gonna make my phone ring, so what's the value of it? I don't know if I'm digressing too much, but um, it's, a, it's a real, real disconnect. Uh, but you have to lay the foundation. If I were to give you 100 new clients, what would you do with them? I remember talking to a woman once who was talking to me about internet marketing. And I said, well, that's fine. We can create e-commerce. And uh, I think she had a, like a clothing store, clothing boutique. So I said, okay, I can create the e-commerce. I can set all that up. I can give you great SEO. We can make it so that, you know, you're very competitive locally because nationally you can't be competitive. There's no way. Uh, and then she came back and basically said, I, I, you know what? I, I don't think I want that because if we have more people coming into the store, I'd have to hire more people. I'd have to do more work. We'd have to have more inventory. The system isn't just, it's just not set up. They have to grow more slowly. Boy, yeah, that's a, a we call that a Cadillac problem to, uh, you know, be kind of uh, hesitant or afraid of growth. You know, the, the reality is I think most small businesses and, and particularly my audience, which is, is going to be largely e-commerce driven and, you know, many of them will have their own brands. And although we all face the cash flow challenges of trying to keep up with inventory, I just had one of my... Uh, uh, colleagues, they, they had their product featured on Good Morning America this morning. They sold 10,000 units in one day, uh, which is what they allocated, but now they're back ordered. So it, it's a great experience for them, and it's a Cadillac problem to have that. Um, and so most folks, I think, are willing to lean into that problem. So what do you tell those types of people? No matter where they come from, doesn't matter if they're mom and pops or solopreneurs or solo attorneys for that matter, How do, for the ones who want the leads, what, what's some best practices they can put into place? You know, you have to build it as if it's going to come. Uh, what was that movie, Field of Dreams or something? If you build it, it will come. So many people, uh, it's very easy to get into this rut way of thinking where I don't have any money. I can't invest in Google AdWords. I can't in invest in Facebook advertising. Uh, I'm going to build my own website, even though they don't know web design or SEO, just wildly common. 
I mean, unbelievably common. Uh, you know, these DIY websites and then nobody ever finds it. So you have to build it expecting people to come. You have to, whatever it is that you do, you have to scale it and say, look, it might not be happening now, but my phone is going to be ringing. I have to be able to handle at least five clients at the same time. So what's your onboarding process? What's your workflow? If five people contact you at the same time and they want to work with you, what are you going to do? Uh, you have to have that set up. If you have a DIY website, hey, that's fine. If you don't like money, if you're not interested in growing a business and you just want to post photos of your cat or water, water skiing squirrels or whatever it is that they do, that's fine. I've been doing this since the mid-90s now. I've never seen a DIY free website that ever generated any income. Never, not one, okay? And I'm not saying that to put people down, I'm just saying that's the that's reality. You get out what you put in. So I would tell people to build it as if you expect people to come. Scale slowly. If you don't have a lot of money to invest, there's nothing wrong with that. You don't go to Starbucks every morning. You don't eat out for 90 days. You'd be amazed how much you can save if you don't go anywhere for 90 days. You know, I call it the, the, the 2G budget, gas and groceries. Don't go anywhere for 90 days and you'll save enough money that you can put it into LinkedIn ads and be very specific or put it into Facebook ads and do the scatter shot wide approach. Mm -hmm. Or you could invest in postcards and just send them out to people that you think you'd like to work with but be prepared to get some freaking phone calls. You know, don't say I'm gonna create a website, but then there's no content. You know, um, I talked to a solo practice lawyer uh, recently who um, had a do-it-yourselfer website. He was a, a tough guy, didn't wanna spend any money, not a penny. And that's fine, that, that's his prerogative, God bless him. But he, you know the problem. The phone isn't ringing. Nobody's noticing him. I don't understand why. And basically I found out after basically two phone calls, he's working for a much older established law firm. Doesn't really need it. They're giving him the client. So this is more something. In other words, you have to have skin in the game. So I would say build your foundation as if you're going to get at least five clients coming in per day. Scale it like that. Plan for growth. Prepare for it. Read a book a week. You know, go to Udemy and sign up for the free online business courses. Uh, there's a website called Open Culture. You can go to and take all the free business courses you want. So there's really no excuse today for people to be uninformed, just, well, I don't know what to do, or I, I don't know about X, Y, Z when you have all this wealth of information available to you online. So be yeah. informed, build to scale, um, get out what you put in. If you don't know what you're doing, start saving and start planning, have a, a business plan. And that's basically where I get wound up, so to speak, is building a comprehensive marketing plan uh, that has different levels or different tiers. So, you would have different approaches. So let me ask this, I do a lot. I'm sorry to jump in, David, but I, sure, I have sure. a question about, so, you know, I, I generally agree with this premise that, you know, if somebody just builds a site uh, that's on the free Wix or the free, you know, uh, I don't even know all the names out there these days, then it's going to be tough for that to turn into actually a real commercial business. Uh, but what's your opinion about the, the sites like Shopify or, um, you know, similar platforms? I, I can't think of some of the others off the top of my head. Uh, you know, WordPress, WooCommerce, what's your thoughts about those? And uh, those seem to be kind of uh, very commonly used. How does that interface yeah. with the work you do? Well, there's a profound difference between the free DIY sites and working with a professional developer who knows what he or she is doing and they have credentials and they've been doing it for you know a decade or two and they've got credentials and so on. There's a big, big difference. It's, you know, on Amazon, they have do-it-yourself dentistry kits. There's a big difference. Um, 
as far as Shopify, it's kind of the same thing because you're basically using a do-it-yourself builder to build something and then put it out there into the world. And you're basically expecting that people are going to find you. How? How are they going to find you? If you're not investing in advertising or unless you're working with someone who knows SEO really well, how is anybody ever going to find you? It has to be a very, very narrow, specific niche or else nobody's going to find you. That's I mean, for sure. Any website. Let's get no real. Yeah, no matter what. Yeah. Amazon, you know. If you put a product on Amazon, if you put a website out there, it's just one of the billions and billions of stars in space. Uh, without a route to find you, I completely agree that you must have it. So let's assume that we have a, a nicely built website. Sure. Um, and, and so we're prepared, we're ready to scale. What do we do to drive traffic to that website? Um, it, I'm assuming that you built it with someone who has knowledge of SEO. What can you do to build that e-commerce site so that it gets more uh, lead generation, right? Mm -hmm. More right. patronage. Blogging is pretty big. Um, I was number one on Google when I was in Denver, Colorado. I'm in Florida now. And I'll never forget a competitor called me up. And his exact words were, you beautiful bastard, what did you do? Now, I knew right away who it was, and he was a really, really nice guy. And one of these people is just so likable, you can't help but, you know, want to give him a hug when you see him. He said, how did you get to be number one on Google? I said, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, you're right up there. And I told him, I don't look at it every day. It's too stressful. I don't want to know. You work toward that goal. So basically, I said, well, I've been tinkering with the website uh, every day on a regular basis, fine-tuning the content, fine-tuning the SEO, looking at what competitors are doing, what they're saying, what they're writing about, and trying to appeal to my ideal client, that ideal niche client. I, back then, I was saying I don't want to be a web developer. I want to be somebody who uses the web to help businesses grow. A big difference. I don't want to be slinging templates and you know competing on Craigslist or Fiverr to try to pay the rent. I want to be working with people with real businesses with real problems. So I want to change that. So I kept tinkering with the content on a daily basis. What that did was it kept pushing me up Google slowly but surely because to Google, this website is being changed so often it's got things going on. So blogging is still very, very important. It's still very relevant. Um, how many of these e-commerce sites don't block? Yeah, many, many people miss that opportunity. So just to drive this point home, and I'm going to put it in my own words, but please feel free sure. to correct me, David. But the idea of Google, so first of all, the, this, the, the premise that SEO is dead is a misunderstood premise, right? We, we, we agree that that is complete crap, right, David? If that, let's say that. If that were the case, how would you have Google making more money and still be in business? You know, how would Google AdWords be this multi-million dollar enterprise that it is? Why would big, big, giant mega corporations like Coca-Cola and Disney be investing in SEO on a daily basis? That makes no sense. Well, but Google uh, AdWords, for clarity, that's the paid platform. That's SEM, search engine marketing, for the right. lay people out there. And that's right. where we just pay for our placements. But SEO, search engine optimization, yes. this is where you're trying to – to get yourself in the organic listings. It used to be way easier uh, in the old yeah. days. But th so the premise that that's gone, despite them ratcheting down and, and unleashing the menagerie of animals as they have over the past 10, 15 years, um, making it harder, real content and quality content still ranks organically. That's fundamentally a point, yes? Absolutely. Um, I I've actually consulted uh, with larger uh, marketing agencies and they there are some who are very competitive in their SEO just by writing uh, content just by blogging on a regular recurring basis very aggressively writing about everything that they think their ideal clients want to know about so you could still move the meter by blogging on a regular recurring basis the more often you write uh, good content, not crap content, 
but good content that's actually thought out, like a research paper with lots of links and videos and, and imagery. Google picks all that up. Your alt tags, your meta, and all that stuff. The more often you do that on a regular recurring scheduled basis, like every Monday at 9 a.m., for example, Google's going to automate that and start looking. It's going to be trained, so to speak, or primed to be looking for this. Uh, and it can actually still move the meter. SEO ain't dead, believe me. Yeah, it's more I, difficult. That's a big difference. It's more difficult to get a grip on because Google is the leader. They're not going anywhere for at least another decade or so, and they keep changing their algorithms every quarter or so. So it's harder to get a grip on it. It's more time-consuming. But Google owns that space right now. Yahoo had their chance, and they weren't interested. Yeah, they also weren't interested when Microsoft offered to buy them for $50 billion and later yeah. sold for a, a few billion in a fire sale and had to yeah. give some of the money back after they got sued for uh, – Yeah, don't get me started on that. It's just – yeah, it, it's it, there's lost opportunity. So you're right. We won't uh, digress to there. But the other point I want to help uh, drive home, and David alluded to this, but recency is a big part of what my interpretation of the Google algorithm likes. Recency and kind of the consistency of change, right? So if you just make a static page out there in space, it's going to stay pretty static and not changing. Whereas if I, you modify and add stuff, it seems to be better. David? I can tell you right now. Um, my, let me see. I, my two main business websites are on the both on the first page of Google right now for the SEO that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So as, it's working. I mean, it's right there at the top of Google search results. If SEO were dead, I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and it's really some of the changes that you can do can take 10 minutes. But if you don't know how to do it, then you can't do it. But... SEO is absolutely here to stay. It's not changing. It's becoming more complex. It's more time consuming. You're not going to get into Google Analytics. Um, if you, you know, you have to study it. It's difficult. I have to get up to speed. And if you have, if you have the skills or had it and you haven't used it in a long time, then you got to go back and relearn it because it changes so quickly. But that's why I'm a firm believer that the business owners should run their business, be the best they can at that, and then let the professional web developer build their site. But just vet who you're, who you're working with, you know. Yep, I quite agree. So that, that premise of bringing in expertise around you to supplement your, your you know, the, the skills or the gaps in skills that may exist – uh, it's true in, in every category to be, and it certainly could be true in this. So let's assume that we've got reasonable SEO. We've got a, a reasonable site built. What's the next thing that they could do to drive leads? Because, uh, you know, I want to make sure we, we give yeah. some, some uh, little nugget here before we have to tie, uh, tie this one off. No, I appreciate you keeping me on track. I can digress if I don't have enough caffeine. You've got your SEO. You've got the content marketing. You want to push that with social Keep in mind that social media is just a distribution system. That's all it is. It's not a miracle. You've got to have good content to funnel through social media channels on a regular recurring basis. Every week has you know, something exciting that's fun for people. But I like to combine digital marketing with what I call old school boots on the ground marketing. And if I work with a client and – I'm not going to work with somebody if I don't feel I can really knock it out of the park with them and really deliver uh, in spades. I really want to ram it home or else I'm not going to do it. So you do that by combining old school boots on the ground marketing. That would be, let's say you're a lawyer, okay, it, just for yeah. the sake of brevity. Let's say you're a lawyer, you can't get enough clients, okay, very common problem. Let's say they've got a great website. They're writing blogs on a weekly basis. They take the blog post. They convert it into a podcast. And now they turn it into a video. So they have a weekly video series on YouTube that they can send to other video sharing sites. They have a weekly podcast. They've got a weekly blog posts. Oh, that's great. They've got it all done, all the SEO, everything's great. Now, what, you, what can you do on top of that to bring in even more referrals? Well, you could go to a website like meetup.com. Start a local group to provide advice, some kind of a networking get together type of meeting group to bring in physical bodies 
people coming in for a lawyer, it's great because I know their profession, their field. So if you're, you could have a, a, a meetup group discussing what divorcing couples should know, or you know how to handle child custody issues, or a divorce healing group, I, or divorced singles group. I've seen that. Divorced singles get together. Who's the host or organizer of the group? This really nice the, um, divorce attorney. Obviously, he's got it. You know, he's helping singles get together, but he's got his own mind as well, getting the word out. It's indirect, but it's getting the word out. So you want to look at how you can do things in an old school physical way. Have a presentation to professional associations that has a very, very high return on investment. Um, I've never had a case where I would give a presentation to a professional association and not gotten follow-up phone calls or could you work with a friend of mine or I w- I'd, I'd be interested in working with you. Could you send me a prospectus or could we talk? I've never had that happen where you've given a presentation, but it's got to be a professional association, electricians, lawyers, doctors, dentists, whomever. So there's a ton in there, uh, David. There's uh, just uh, so many tactics and things that people can do to right. deploy both on the local level or on the national level, right? Webinars would be the same thing as giving presentations, right? And this right. Like, videotape them. Yeah, this yeah. this follow this follows the general premise of let's go ahead and give something of value and then you know see what comes back to us, right? We and and we like that as awesomers. So we're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back. We're going to give David the final word. Give us a kind of the crystal ball view, the future of how he sees kind of internet marketing going. And we're going to do that right after this. Hey, Amazon Marketplace professionals. Congratulations on your success to date. Your creativity, strategic vision, problem solving, and discipline have allowed you to build your own e-commerce business. Wouldn't it be great if you had more time to focus on the things that truly drive the sales and growth of your company? Instead of getting lost in a dozen different services and countless spreadsheets, what if there was one system that connected to your Amazon on account and automatically gave you the information that you needed to make great decisions and really impact your business. Parsimony ERP can do that. Parsimony is the business operating system for your marketplace business. With Parsimony, you get true double entry bookkeeping, easy financial statements, full customer service tools, and item by item profitability, along with project and task management, and more features are being added all the time. Learn more at parsimony.com. That's parsimony, P-A-R-S-I-M-O-N y.com or simply.com we've got that you're listening to the awesomers podcast okay guys we're back again steve simonson here with david summer Summerfleck, uh and we're talking about all things digital marketing and and trying to really t- put a bow on this thing we've talked about the idea that you know seo is still relevant there's different ways that we can we can market and and bring content to our sites to make it more relevant but you know, David, one of the things that I always like to get uh, uh, an opinion of, especially somebody who's been, you know, in the internet space since the mid '90s, right? That's uh, I go back to that same same length of time. My first website was put up in 1996, and it was not awesomer. I can just uh, give full yeah. disclosure on it. But uh, so, from your experience, where do you see the future of internet marketing going? Let's say in the next five years, any surprises? Any uh, um, here, Ed? I think a lot of it is already very intuitive in that you pretty much know what to expect. Um, Basically what we're going to see is more of what we have now. More and more people are going to be doing everything using their phone. If anything, I think phones are probably going to get fatter. Um, You know, this thing, you know, I think is going to, they're going to continue working on that. And uh, you know, more people have smartphones now than have laptops or PCs. So uh, you've got to have a mobile first sensibility in everything that you do. Uh, when it, it, SEO, writing, everything. So I see more, more of that, more people using mobile for everything that they do. Um, and I think also you're going to see a lot more consolidation. It's about serving the customers, you're going to see more of retail. It's going to be more about what you see now with Amazon, uh, with more consolidation, you know, uh, place your order online, go pick it up, 
or go work with someone. I'm actually very surprised that Amazon hasn't bought up Sears yet and kind of consolidated that with their um, marketplace type of thing where you could hire an electrician, go to Sears and go get supplies or what have you or go meet the electrician or whatever just as they bought up Whole Foods. It's, it's happening already. So I think you're going to see a lot more consolidation of resources and a lot more movement toward mobile than we've ever seen before in history. You know, very, very few people are going to have PCs anymore. You're just going to see a lot more tablets and a lot more of these smartphones. Yeah, you heard it here first, everybody. The The reality is that I, I quite agree that the mobile and the, the multi-device experience, which, right, uh, the customer journey now happens on, many times on multiple devices. Uh, you know, maybe they have working on the computer at the office. Maybe they're surfing on their phone. They get the tablet. It, it just crosses so many devices now. It's it's becoming very convenient for customers. Even today, myself, I've been on multiple devices and, and carrying on more or less the same conversations, right? Yeah. Whether it's a Facebook message yeah. or whatever. So I, I think that's very uh, uh, nice insight. And then, of course, the idea that this convergence of retail and online or so-called omni-channel. It, it will inter- yeah, the interconnectedness. You're going to be getting, you know, messages, SMS. You're going to be getting, you know, newsletters are going to be coming through your text messages. And you're going to, instead of sending emails, you're going to be using things like, uh, was it Loom? Uh, you're going to be doing things like what we're doing now, Google Hangouts and so on on your phone. It's exciting. It's fun but it's overwhelming a lot of business owners who just don't know how to keep up and that's where you have to just ask for help well this is sorry to cut you off i just love no it's it's quite right and i listen i love the passion i love the insights and and i want to say to especially the the smaller uh companies especially mom and pops because i have a deep um background in kind of land-based stores and and uh, retail and so forth and you have done a, a great number of uh you know, kind of the solo uh, attorney office and so forth. Often these these uh, smaller local businesses feel like they're left behind, that the internet's not something they can leverage. And I want to just say as clear as I can, it absolutely can be leveraged to a high, high degree within affordable ranges, right? It, it does take- Oh, absolutely. You can get up there. There is no web developer out there who would not work with you or get on a payment plan. They may say, look, I'm not going to lower my rates because it's still quality. It's still work for me. I still have bills and a family to take care of, but we can get on some kind of a payment plan. There's nobody who is not going to do that. It's about you being receptive uh, to a process that hopefully the digital marketing guru guy is going to have a process um, and know what they're doing as opposed to hobbyist kind of thing where it's disjointed and you hear about all these negative experiences. You well, it, it, it definitely is something uh, – one of the awesomer philosophies that we've shared before is, you know, you really do get out what you put in. And, yeah, that, that, you know, that's both effort, that's intellectual uh, skill building, and it's the same thing when you're trying to invest in something that should be an asset that produces revenue. So, David, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, today. It's been a, a great pleasure to meet you. Don't forget, awesomers, that we'll have the, the links to David's companies on the, uh, the show notes page, which will – Uh, share with you uh, at the end of this episode and uh, we'll be right back after this. Catalyst 88 was developed to help entrepreneurs achieve their short and long-term goals in e-commerce markets by utilizing the power of shared entrepreneurial wisdom. Entrepreneurship is nothing if not lessons to be learned. Learn from others. Learn from us. I guarantee that we will learn from you. Visit Catalyst88.com because your success is our success. A giddy up. You're listening to the Awesomers Podcast. You know, it's a fascinating concept to me that independent law firms or small lawyers who start their own practices really are entrepreneurs in the very traditional sense. I don't always think of law firms that way, but especially these smaller groups and and the guys who start up, uh, and gals for that matter, who start up firms all by themselves, they're a classic entrepreneur, and of course they need help. They have unique problems of being, you know, kind of a local business, so they don't want to advertise to the world like an e-commerce company. And they have other things that, you know, they may have specialties that present unique challenges, right? It's not just any kind of law. Only call me for family law or only call me for patent and trademark law, whatever the case may be. So it's a very interesting thing, and I think a nice reinforcement of some of the basics of web design and remembering that our websites are very important and can be a major source of income for us 
even today in the world of marketplaces like Amazon, eBay, Jet.com, and others kind of taking big bites out of the marketplace uh, at large. You are listening to the Awesomers.com podcast, episode number 34. And to find those secret show notes and details, any links that we may have discussed, just go to Osmers.com backslash 34. As always, all the little details and links and sometimes the books or things that we talk about at Osmers.com backslash 34. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Osmers podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now's a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you could even leave a a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Awesomers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again.